Welcome to Mag Church, everybody. How's everybody this morning? You doing well? Are you alive? Are you awake? Come on. Good, kind of. Well, it's good to be back with you. It feels like it's been forever since I have actually been here. It's been about uh, two Sundays, but I'm ready to roar, right? And so I just got back from vacation, um, and I will tell you a little bit about that uh, here in a second. But uh, I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in here. I'm glad. You guys aren't glad to be here, right? So we, we got we to gotta get a little bit more excited into what we've been, but uh, welcome to MAG Church, everyone. We're so glad that you're joining us, whether you're here in person or online live. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us. And today we are kicking off a new sermon series entitled Homeless Soul. Homeless Soul. We'll be journeying through this sermon series all of August the truth is, I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but I find myself recently feeling very restless. Can anybody attest to that, that you feel restless maybe in your soul, maybe mentally, maybe even physically? The truth is, I can't really put my, my finger on what the actual cause of this restlessness is. I just have this deep longing for something on the inside feels like it, it lies just beneath the surface, just ready, bursting to emerge. I, I find myself frustratingly just waiting for this thing to come forth and have a breakthrough, but my patience, if I'm honest, it, it's growing very thin. I, I just really, I want things to go back to normal. I, I don't want to have to worry about every little thing that's going on, and, and there is this frustration in it, and, and the truth of it is maybe this restlessness. Maybe perhaps it's just this whole, whole COVID thing that we're going through, that we're still going through, right? I thought by now it would be over. I thought by, by, by the time that summer would ro ro run around here and we'd be here, that it would just go away, but it's still here. Perhaps it's the frustration of things unknown, still not knowing. Perhaps it's the loss of loved ones that I wasn't expecting to say goodbye to. Not like that. Perhaps it was just my need for a break. Constantly pouring out. Not getting a chance to be poured into. Whatever it is. My soul feels every single bit of it. Every single bit of it. I wonder if yours is the same way. Do you feel that restlessness this morning? Do you feel deep inside like you're just waiting for a breakthrough, you're waiting for something to change? Does your soul feel the weight of this exact moment that you and I are in? Do you feel it right now? A couple weeks ago, I found myself on vacation in my hometown of Washington Courthouse, Ohio. Now, for some of you that are listening or some of you here and you're going, where in the world is Washington Courthouse, Ohio? Your guess is as good as mine. Because it is a small little town. It's about an hour south of Columbus, but it is where I was born and raised. It's where I lived all of my life until moving here. Now, I got to tell you that I was supposed to be going to Myrtle Beach, right? That's where I wanted to go. That is where my relaxation happens. That's where my get together with my family happens, right? But that didn't happen this year. Instead, I chose to trade in ocean waves for the smell of fertilizer every single day, right? To where there's countless crops all over the place because it is primarily just, just farmland. And you would think that I would, I would hate this, but the truth is, my soul wasn't needing the sound of crashing waves hitting the shore. No, my soul had actually needed the embrace of familiarity. Have you ever been there? To where you just need the embrace of familiarity. It needed to visit the place that fit me like an old, comfortable sweater that covers you from the harsh coldness of this thing called life. Because the truth is, there is nothing worse than feeling like a sojourner without 
a home. There's nothing worse than feeling like a sojourner without a home. In us all, there is this deep desire to find this place that we call home. It doesn't matter how old you are, there is this longing for a place that we could call home. A place where our soul can find healing. A place where we are embraced with love no matter how long it is that we've been gone or away from it. A place that always has a seat for you at the table because you are loved. A place that you are fully known. Fully known yet loved. We are all searching for that. We are all looking for that. But I, I got a question. Why it, can it be? Why is that something that can be so hard to find? Why can it be so hard for us to find somewhere to call home? Why is it that all of our longing and all of our searching that we can still feel so alone in a world with so many people? That even here today, we could be surrounded by some of our brothers and sisters and still feel like we're not home, still just restless. In the book of Genesis, we are given this account of a God who is so powerful. He's so powerful that he can create something out of nothing just by the mere speaking of his words. He creates the sun, the moon, and stars just by his words. He is that powerful. He creates the earth and he fills it with everything needed to sustain life. He takes authority over chaos and creates order. That is the powerful God that we serve. And then he does something seemingly out of character from the text that we read. Instead of just speaking something into being, he decides to hold his words and use his hands. He makes us, you and I, in his image the same God who has the power to speak things into being forms man from the dust of the ground. And here's the crazy thing. He gets close enough to breathe life into him. The audacity of why a God that powerful would touch nothing but a pile of dust and give it purpose is beyond me. Why does he love me? Why does he love you? Why does he pursue us? Why would he do this? Why would he get that close, close enough to embrace, close enough to feel? There is this sheer act of intimacy in this, held between creator and created. And the crazy thing, he's the one that initiates it all. He initiates this relationship. He creates us for purpose. And here's the crazy thing. You are created for relationship with an eternal God simply because, crazy thing, he loves you. Do you understand that here this morning? That God, a God that powerful, the God that powerful loves you, loves me, He initiated this, but to my surprise, he doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just create and leave. This God, this all-powerful God, cares about what he created. He shows compassion to him and cares about his well-being. This God, he sees his creation, and he determines that it is not good for him to be alone. He determines that it's good for him not to be alone, so he creates a companion for his creation. It's this poetic imagery to show a companionship of two people intimately walking side by side. God causes Adam to fall asleep, and he takes and creates woman from a portion of the man's side. And it says something profound after these two people that God had created for one another. It says something that, that kind of shocks me, and here's what it says. It says, now the man and his wife, they were both naked, but they felt no shame. They were both naked, but felt no shame. What we see here is the writer of Genesis 
making a statement to the reader. He's making a statement to you this morning to remember this. It's something that is meant to stop us dead in our tracks and kind of go, wait a second, they felt no shame? They were completely naked, completely, okay, completely vulnerable, and they felt no shame. He does this to pull on the string of our own restless heart and metal and our own searchings. It makes us question how that kind of relationship is attained. Because for a lot of us, we are sitting here even today wrecked with grief, wrecked with shame, wrecked because of our own vulnerability. Because it is the epitome of the place we are all looking for. Home. Home. Still searching. Looking for home where you can be completely unmasked. Looking for home where you can be completely you. Looking for home where you can quit playing the game of trying to appease everybody and look a certain way and be a certain way just to be accepted to where you are accepted for you, where you feel no shame. It is intimacy personified, and we are all looking for it, even though we are desperately scared of it. The truth is that we were all made for relationship. You and I, we are made for relationship. I would say it this way, that we are made for one another. We were made to be known and to be loved. We were not made to live this life alone, even though we try it so many times. In Christianity, in life, there is no such thing as a renegade. God has called us to live together. Now, I'm not saying that's easy. It is very difficult. Because the thing that makes a home, you'll realize, is not the house. It is the people inside that house. I've moved several times, and I didn't care at all about the building. Sure, we had some great memories in there. But my family, my home, went with me. Because the people were with me. And we all deep down inside, despite how hard it is and how much pain we have experienced finding it, we still long for it. And recently it got me pondering a question that I want to ask you today. What do you think is the greatest thing stolen from us at the fall? What do you think is the greatest thing stolen from us at the fall? Again, I'll ask that question. I'll give you some time to think about it. You don't have to answer out loud. I'm not asking that, but just ponder it. What is the greatest thing stolen from us at the fall? And I was thinking about the, that this week, that question. What was the greatest thing stolen from us? You see, I believe that intimacy was the greatest thing stolen from us in the garden. And let me explain that. You see, the enemy's greatest strategy was to disrupt the relationship between Adam and Eve, and more importantly so, to disrupt the relationship between Adam and Eve and God. That's what he does. It's no different today. The reality of it is, is that I find that today there are a lot of us that we live our lives just like Eve. We have grown way too comfortable with voices that have no reason to be capturing our attention. Listening to voices all the time that are just speaking lies and filling our, our minds up with things that don't pertain to anything. Always trying to get us to bite into the things that don't matter, that actually just poison our soul. Always doing it. She is talking to a snake for crying out loud. I don't know about you, but I hate snakes. That's not the thing I'm going to be talking to. And one thing that I can tell you about snakes is that as soon as you get too comfortable with it, too close to it, they're always going to strike. They're always going to strike. And one thing that I can tell you about this serpent, this enemy that we all have, the serpent strikes with nothing but a question, and he does the same thing in our lives today. Did God really say? Boy, if there is ever a question that highlights our current reality and our current culture, it is that question 
Did God really say? Because people are questioning God left and right all the time. And then they wonder why they're in the situation that they're in. Did God really say? He asked that question because he knew that if he could confuse Eve on who God is, listen to this, then he could strip her of her own identity. If he could get her to question who God is to her, if he could get her to question the goodness of God, then he could in fact strip her of her own identity. He could deconstruct her entire faith just by a question. How do I know this? Because I see it happen even today. Satan proposes an idea that the only reason that God would tell her that she would die if she ate it was simply because God was trying to suppress her. God wanted to keep her from knowing not only the knowledge of good but also evil. He, he, he basically kind of led to the idea that you could be like God and he's just trying to keep you from being like God. A simple question rocked her faith. She believed it, she took the fruit from the tree, and she ate it, and it says something in Scripture, it says that all of a sudden, their eyes were opened. Their eyes are open to the reality of not just good, but also evil. Not just good, but also evil. As I was putting this together... There was something that I, I just couldn't get over. I, I started wondering, why didn't Eve just consult with God about what the serpent was saying? You ever ponder that? Like, why didn't she just go to God and just say, hey, here's what the serpent is saying. He, he's saying that you're trying to keep me from doing this. She, it doesn't say that she ever does this. To me, what this is telling me is that this isn't something that just happened one day. That's not what, what this is, is telling us. I, I believe that this is something that took time and effort to set up because any time that you give up your identity, it is never just a one-time event. Most of the time, it's something that happens over a long period of time. Satan just chipping away little by little of your foundation. Satan, over time, broke her down by gaining her trust a little by little until he could get her to bite into what she was never supposed to. Did you actually notice his strategy in this? If you didn't, let me help you out with something. Satan drew her away from Adam. And not just Adam, he drew her away from God. It says that she is at this tree and she's having this conversation. He, he whispered in her ear to cause her to isolate and withdraw herself from the very people who could help fight the battle that was in her mind. He, he pulls her away and isolates because if Adam was there, he could have caught it, but he didn't. If God was nearby, he could have stomped the head of the serpent, but he had drawn her away. And it seems like God allowed this to happen. God will sometimes allow you to make your own choice. It's heavy, isn't it? Draws her away from Adam, draws her away from God, and by doing this, it confirmed what God knew, that it is not good for man to be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. This is why you have to be careful with who you allow to whisper in your ear, especially in chaotic times. Because their whisperings of sweet nothing can be just that, nothing. Nothing. Nothing good comes out of the words. Literally nothing good comes out of what, what Satan is trying to do here. It just looks good to her. Have you ever been in a situation in your life to where it looked good until you bit into it? It looked so delicious until you bit into it. That is the effect of sin, my friends. It always looks so good until you bite it and you bit off more than you could chew. And before you know it, it just poisoned your soul and it is killing you. It says in, in, in 7 that at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly 
felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Stark difference, isn't it? To where when they are fully in relationship and with God and trusting God, they were completely able to be vulnerable, fulfilled, and felt no shame. And here they are now, broken relationship, not only between both of them, but also with God. And here they are, standing completely naked, feeling shame, feeling remorse, and what they're doing is they are running to hide. Because isn't that what we do? It's so much easier sometimes to hide from our situations and our problems than to face our situations and our problems. This right here, this whole situation is the reason that you and I struggle to find home. It is the reason why we have this longing. I don't have to wonder how this felt because I feel it every single day. And I bet you do too. We all know the feeling of this familiar friend that I don't like called shame. It accompanies me every single day. I wake up with it. You probably do too. How many times have I found myself just sewing fig leaves together to cover myself from the wretched sinner that I am? God, forgive me. Help me to be better than this. God, I don't want you to see me like this. Don't put your eyes on me. I have, I've failed you. Have you ever, ever felt that way? What this shows me, that all of us know, all of us struggle with, is that intimacy is very scary. Intimacy is very scary. I love to tell you that getting close to people is easy. And it isn't. Can we talk about that for a second? Intimacy is scary. And it's scary because it requires a risk. It always requires a risk. Whenever you get close enough, they get close enough to get close to you, to embrace you. You get close enough to reveal secrets about your life. You get close enough to make yourself vulnerable. And the risk in that is that they could take your heart and crush it and break it right before you. How many of us have experienced that in our lives, that we're still trying to pick up the pieces from people that have shattered us? It brings about disappointment, doesn't it, so many times? How many of us have been disappointed by the way that people that we love have acted in our life? How many times have we been disappointed in the way that we've acted in our own lives? Intimacy is getting close enough to actually be hurt. Did you hear me? Intimacy is deciding, choosing to get close enough to be hurt. And that therein lies the problem. We try to avoid hurt. I've got too much hurt in my life. I don't want any more hurt in my life. And so we have this tendency to build walls. Most of us have gotten so good at sowing fig leaves to look like we have it all together, like we got this. But the truth is that we are just scared to death, hiding behind trees, fearful of our own failings. That's where we find ourselves. Intimacy means being known by someone, and so many of us have had people leave us once they truly know us. And that makes us feel like everyone else is going to leave us too. We struggle with that. We struggle with seeing God because everybody else has left. I'll never forget this one time I had this... Uh, this kid was probably 20 years old at the time. He was probably about my age, and he was coming to the church that I used to pastor, and he had always had this uh, tense relationship with his father. And I can never forget, like, he came into my office one time, and he was struggling with just relationship and who he was, and his father wanted nothing to do with him. And he was talking to me, and, and he said, would you go with me to just see him, to see if I could talk to him, because he lived in the same town, and I didn't know what to really expect of it, but sometimes you get yourself in situations for the benefit of intimacy. And I knew there would be risk involved. I remember us going up to this house 
We had no clue what it was going to be. This kid had not seen his father in like 18 years. And I remember I stayed in the car. I said, do you want me to go? And he said, no, no, I, I just, I remember he opened the door. And I was watching this all unfold. And all of a sudden, it literally was maybe a two-minute conversation. The door shuts in this kid's face. And he walks back. We get in the car. He shuts the door. I didn't even know what to say. And have you ever seen someone just go in a rage? He was punching the dashboard. You know what he kept saying over and over again? Why doesn't he love me? Why doesn't he lo- Why doesn't anybody love me? And because of that relationship and that breakdown of intimacy, he felt that way his entire life. And not only did he view that through the lens of that and other people, he also viewed God in the lens of that too, as if, if his own father couldn't love him. How could God love him? Because to him, the only thing he had ever known was people leaving. He was desperately trying to find a place at a table and not have his chair taken when he left. I wonder how many of you are like that too. Afraid and scared to death that everybody is leaving you because in your life you have felt that way and there's this restlessness of just finding a place to call home. And deep down inside you feel like you will never find home. It's better for a lot of us just to stay away from it. Thirdly, intimacy is willing to ask where you are. Intimacy is willing to be asking the question of where are you? When the, it says in, in, in Genesis 3, 8, when the cool evening breeze, breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Where are you? This shows how effective the lies of Satan were to both Adam and Eve. The very person who had formed them and breathed life into them and walked beside them and gave them purpose is now the person, the very person who they are hiding from. They are hiding from the only person who can fix the situation. It's what happens when Satan gets into your mind and twists the idea of who God is. They are hiding from God and the only person, he is the only person that can fix this. God sees, God knows exactly where they're at. God knows exactly what they've done. Why are they hiding? It just looks ridiculous. You know what I would have done if I was God? See you guys later. Time to restart. Boom! But you know what this God does? He doesn't do any of that. He asks them just a simple question. Where are you? That wasn't a question because he didn't know where they were. It was a question for them. Where are you? Is this what you wanted? Is this what you thought it was going to be? You standing behind, hiding from the very person that loves you more than anything? Is this what you wanted, the shame that you have, of the brokenness and the breakdown of intimacy? Is, is this what you wanted? Was, was it worth it? Was the bite worth it? Was the taste worth it? Where are you? Because when you love someone, listen to me, when you love someone, that question is one of concern for the well-being. It's not there to shame them. It's there to really, because God wants to let them know that I care about you. I, I want to know where you're at, but, but i got to tell you that you've messed it up. You, you've messed it up horribly. The truth is that God allowed them to hide. Do you understand that? God allowed them to hide. He could have stopped at any moment, but God allowed them to make a choice. God allowed them to hide because intimacy can't be coerced. 
intimacy can't be coerced. Here's a, something that you need to understand, that God doesn't want compliance. He wants connection. If he wanted you just to love him, he could have programmed you to love him automatically and just made you robots, but he wants you to choose to love him. He wants you to choose to have a relationship with him. He, he, wants, he doesn't want just compliance, he wants connection because intimacy can respect distance. Intimacy can respect distance, but it isn't content with it. Like God in the garden, intimacy calls out, where are you? I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for God that wonders where I am, that wants to know where I am. And you know what Adam responds and how he responds? I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. For Adam, that's the whole problem. He doesn't know where he is. All he knows is that God doesn't want to see him, that he doesn't want God to see him like this. He doesn't want God to see him naked like this. He doesn't want God to see him shaking because he's so afraid. He doesn't want God to see him all ashamed and feeling shameful, completely vulnerable. I find it interesting that he says that he is afraid. He's afraid. How many times has he stood before God the same way and never felt afraid until that moment? You know why that is? Because it was right there that he realized that intimacy between he and God had been stolen. That it was not the same. That his shame of his own brokenness and sin in his life couldn't stand in the presence of a holy God. God asked them, what have you done? What, what have you, what have you done? Well, God, we, we've, we've made a mess of things. I've messed this all up and I don't, I don't know what to do. God begins to hand down all these awful things that are going to befall Adam and Eve. You can read it all in Genesis 3 and how sin is going to impact their lives, how it's going to break down their relationship, how their own relationships will suffer with each other and not only between man and woman but also between God. How not only will they have knowledge of, of good things They'll also have the knowledge of evil. And here's the, the tough thing about that. It just won't be knowledge. It'll also be experience. For the first time, they will experience and taste the pain of losing someone. For the first time, they will experience death within itself. For the first time, they will feel disconnection from the very source of their life. That for the first time, they will experience that. How all of their lives... They will have struggles until the day that they die. It just seems awful, right? This searching for home. God, I just, I wanted to go back to the way it was. Why can't we do that? But I was searching through that whole thing that God was telling them. I, I was just, I was reading through it. I kept looking for something specifically. You know what I never found that he said in any of that? I, I never I never found this. I, I found it interesting that in all of what he said, God never once told them that he didn't love them. He told them what would happen, what would be the, 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 the response because of it, but he never once said, and, and i got to let you know that I'm done with you, that I don't love you anymore, I'm not going to pursue you anymore, I don't care about you. He could have laid out the whole sentence and then left and been done with them forever and created something else, but he did not do that. He never once said that he was going to leave them. Not once did he ever say any of that, and it got me wondering, why did he even come back? Why did he even come back to the scene? He knew they messed up royally. Let them just be in their mess up. Because intimacy gets close enough to have your heart broken. And true intimacy says, I won't give up. 
this God that we serve is relentless after your soul. And I am thankful for a God that doesn't give up, doesn't leave me in my mess, but comes down into my mess and pulls me out of whatever mess that I have made. He corrects, he cre- he corrects the mistakes of my life. Not once did he say that. In fact, it leads me to see a God who despite their nakedness, despite their failures in hiding, care more about where they are than what they have done. Chose me a God that despite all that cares more about where they are than what they have done. And I'm not saying he doesn't care about what they've done. I'm saying he cares more about knowing where they are and them knowing where they are. Because here's the thing. You have to know where you are, know why you got there, know who you need to get you out of it before you can ever start thinking that someone can rescue you from it. And to my amazement, I would think that God would say it and be done. But I think God knew the pain of broken intimacy too. I thought for sure he would leave. In fact, we probably all thought that too, didn't we? When you read this this story, wouldn't you think that, yeah, they probably, he probably left him. Why do you think that? Because you've experienced in your life, whenever you've not been good enough, whenever you've failed miserably, you've had people leave. That's just been your experience. So when you read something like this, and when the author was writing this, they used to have this idea that there was a God that just simply created the world and then left it. But the story about this God that we serve is that he creates it. His own creation rebels against him, chooses someone else over him, doesn't walk away. (laughs) He makes clothes for them. I don't know why that hit me so hard this week. But when I really started thinking about that, he could have left them looking ridiculous. He could have left them feeling their shame. He could have done it all, but instead, he says, I can't, I can't leave them like this. I can't leave them broken. I can't leave them scared. I can't leave them sewing fig leaves together. What I need to let them know is that I am a God that will make a way where there seems to be no way. I am a God that can clothe you. I am a God that even right now, though this is temporary, I'm going to prepare a way to bring you back into relationship. We all have this longing because of the fall to find home again. We all want to go back to the garden to where we can be completely ourselves, completely known, yet completely loved despite everything that we've done, that people don't give up on us all the time. Maybe it's just the subtle way of God letting us know that when that happens that he won't give up on us. I don't know about you, but I need to see that today. I need to see that God does not give up, that he's pursuing. I think that's why I needed vacation. Because even sometimes the people that prepare the messages wonder if God is still around. And then something weird on vacation happened. Towards the end, we're we're packing up to leave. I'm, I'm, I'm loading up my car. Rachel's in, in, the, in the passenger seat. Gavin's in the back. And it's my father and I. And normally, like, it's, it's just the normal thing. You know, we say goodbye to each other. We laugh. I've, I've been there for, you know, like seven days or something like that. I throw my last heavy luggage up. And my dad just, because my dad always has to help, you know, put everything away. And I remember, like, I turned, I turned around, and I looked back, and I looked him directly in his eye, and I said, Dad, thanks for just letting us stay. God, I hope I can get through this. And I went to turn away, and he kind of grabbed my, 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 my shoulder. And just the way that he said this, 
just the way that he looked me dead in the eye, and it was something I never did, and he probably doesn't even realize he did it, and maybe it's just something that I needed in the moment, what he just said, any time, any time, and here's the thing, I've had so many people say that to me, any time, but I've seen them leave. But this man right here, all of my life has always meant it. That no matter how long I've been away, I can come back to what is home. That I could come there and there's always a place. No matter how far away that I've been, that I can always come home and I am loved exactly for who I am. And I knew he meant it. Here I am being all manly like, oh, yeah man dad, I'll see you later get in the car, but I knew that he meant it, that I'm completely loved, that I can be completely vulnerable, that no matter what kind of mess that I get into, that he would tell me we will figure it out. And it was in that moment that I needed that message more than anything else. Because i got to tell you, this season has been difficult on my soul. I have lost people that I love. I am wondering what the heck is going on. Not everybody has come back yet. And Satan will mess with your mind. And what I needed to know is that one, I'm not a failure. Two, that God still got me. And three, that there's still a place that I can go called home to where I can bring all my burdens. And what they actually care about is where I am, not what I've done. To where they can see me for me I'm not saying they always accept everything that it is, but love isn't conditional, that it's unconditional. That he will prepare a place for me when I need it. And I saw so clearly the image of Jesus in my father that day. That he will always clothe me and showed me the truth about God creating clothes that I will cover your shame, that I will fix this, even if it costs me my life. I will fix this, even if it costs me my life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting For those of you that feel like you've got a homeless soul, he has gone to prepare a way. He has made a way where there seems to be no way. You do not have to be a wanderer. You do not have to be a nomad in this crazy, chaotic world. That there is a God who has prepared a place for you, and there is a seat for you at the table if you want it. It'll always be there. He's chasing after you all the time. He's calling out for you. He wants you to know where you're at, and he wants you to let you know that no matter how far you run, he will come after you because he loves you. And just like my father, you may be trying to run away. He's going to grab you by the shoulder and pull you back and say, I've got you anytime. You can come here anytime you can come here. I wonder how many of you feel that way. Will you just bow your heads with me? I'm just going to ask a question. Is there anybody here, maybe there's a couple of you that maybe this message has really hit you. You feel like you've been wondering, maybe a homeless soul, maybe we just call it that. Will you just lift your hand if maybe you feel like a, a homeless soul today? Just feel like maybe I see that hand, I see that hand. I see that hand. Just needing God to move in your life. 
How many of you feel like you've been left behind? How many of you feel like maybe intimacy is a, is a problem that you face in your life? You just want people to love you. Maybe you even feel like you're unloved here today. I just want to pray with you here this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We know that life is difficult, and especially when we get into relationships and pursue intimacy, getting close enough to people, we risk having our hearts ripped out and broken. All of us here have been hurt, broken by people that we've allowed into our lives. Lord, and I pray that we would get jaded by that reality. But the beat that we would understand that hurt people hurt people. That we don't give up on people, God, that we can learn to go to you. And I pray, Lord, that they will understand their value, not on what has happened to them, but in who you say they are. Because one of the greatest strategies that Satan did in that garden was to strip Eve of her identity of knowing who she was. Because if he could come against who you were, it makes her question who she is. God, I pray that we will understand who we are today, that we are loved, that we have purpose. And God, may we repent of the sins in our lives and walk after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, I love each and every one of you. I want to let you know that I know that these times are difficult, but we will make it through this together. Here's the thing. If you ever need anything, you know that we're here. The reality, though, is that we are not mind readers. So if there's things that are going on in your life, feel free to call. Feel free to say something, because that's part of relationship. You know, if we need something, we call each other. If we don't have something like that, hey, don't be upset if people don't know, right? And so please try to do that, because part of intimacy is being able to be honest and real about maybe what's going on in our lives, guys. I love you. I was completely transparent up here. Hey, I've been, been struggling. Pray for me. I'm praying for you. And we will see you. We don't see you Wednesday. We'll see you next Sunday, okay, as we continue in homeless soul. Love you guys.